Hey everyone, I'm Michael Short. Come on, let's go outdoors. Welcome to Lesser Slave Lake, where about uh, seven years ago, the commercial fishery was shut down after close to a hundred years of operation here on the lake. But what impact has the closure had on fish stocks since then? That's what we're here to find out. Oh, thanks, Christy. There we go. To be sort of our average walleye that we'd be getting out of Slave Lake, so the reason folks are coming over to Slave Lake. Probably just sitting around about a 47 centimeter, 48 centimeter walleye. Oh, again, I think that'd be pretty typical for Slave Lake, Christy, eh? Yeah. Nice. It's a fishing experience like this, which makes a trip out onto Lesser Slave Lake worthwhile ensuring there are quality angling opportunities well into the future is a priority for fishery managers. So, you know, I think what we want to try to do is prov keep providing those um, sustainable harvest opportunities, revisit those objectives, uh, and, and really chart a course for Lesser Slave Lake that means it's sustainable as we grow. Since the closure of the commercial fishery, the time is right to revisit regulation objectives. And then I think the piece that we're still seeing some, some improvement in uh, is certainly just the catch rates overall. I think what we're typically hearing and seeing from anglers is on average catching slightly bigger fish and on average, uh, at least in certain parts of the lake, uh, catching a few more fish. So I think ultimately, Michael, the answer is yes, we're seeing some, uh, uh, some improvement that anglers are now seeing in their catch rate. So in terms of sustainability, the question is, what should be the recreational fishing priorities Angling efforts on the lake have reached as high as 350,000 hours, which has resulted in a decline in both size and number of walleye in the past. What catch rate is acceptable to you? What size structure do you want to see? And when we know that, that helps us gauge then uh, a regulation that might say, yeah, you know, if, if we sit in one to two hours per hectare, uh, we can offer more harvest. If we climb that high again, we need to reduce the bag limits, uh, or it is likely we will see more fish leave uh, that then impacts the experience. The catch rate goes down. The big fish become absent. I mean, we've caught some really nice big fish out there, I'm not going to lie, but I'm not a trophy fisherman. I'm strictly food. I think a slot size is a decent idea. Have a slot size and the bigger breeders can carry on them. Those are usually the best eating fish anyway. If you're going to regulate it for sure, yeah, it's pretty decent. And uh, I'm not sure what the numbers are, but they seem to be pretty good here. So it's nice to take a couple of fish home if you can. Managing the fish resources for First Nations remains a top priority. Absolutely. We have local members uh, and local harvesters around the lake. We also fall within um, all of the Métis harvesting zones within the province. So we do have opportunities for those to travel to the area and subsistence harvest within Lesser Slave Lake as well. Indigenous fisheries are regulated through a separate process. There's a guide for that uh, that's available online. And it, you know we do have active conversations with those groups about things like size limits and uh, what size of, of gill net is used uh, with the idea of sustainability and conservation still being first and foremost uh, in delivering those fisheries. Between 80 to 100,000 anglers visit Lesser Slave Lake every year. So ensuring other fish species like pike, which recent surveys are showing signs of a reduced catch rate, are included in any new management objectives review is under consideration. I think going forward, the, the question around pike and what we want to get from input from, uh, from all users is going to be, uh, you know, not only on walleye, which is why uh, a lot of people come to Lesser Slave Lake these days, uh, but on other species such as pike. Looking beyond the shores of the lake, biologists also have to take into account what impact other activities may have on fish habitat. Certainly it's a cumulative effect uh, piece when we consider what happens with fish populations. So there's direct impacts to the fishery, like fishing. Uh, and there's indirect, so if we consider the health of contributing watersheds, the integrity of uh, aquatic habitat, whether that's shoreline or the contributing river systems, uh, things like water quality, water quantity, uh, materials that are recruiting in, things like trees offer uh, habitat and naturally cycle into the water body, as well as the level of disturbance along the shoreline. So ensuring that while people are recreating, uh, we're not seeing you know waste or garbage or anything like that that could potentially detract from it. 
Uh, so yeah, we, we look to consider both those direct and indirect impacts when looking at managing a fishery. Perhaps no area is more critical than the walleye spawning grounds. We think of this, this large fishery that really, uh, again, still has a lot of dependence on things like tributaries that have clean water, have a sufficient water to produce um, you know, walleye, water that leaves through the Lesser Slave River and contributes to the Athabasca River and that population eventually on there. So um, you're right, Michael, it isn't just one, it's not just a regulation change on Lesser Slave Lake that will really determine the sustainability of those fisheries. Um, it will require that watershed approach. Lesser Slave Lake is not immune to the consequences of overfishing and habitat loss. A lesson from the commercial fishery is top of mind where unsustainable harvest and inadequate assessment resulted in the loss of lake trout in the early 1900s to the point where none survive today. Walleye have also seen significant sways in population, coming close to loss in two past eras. Biologists today are vigilant about not repeating the same mistake. Yeah, ultimately, uh, when you're thinking about fish and fisheries, uh, you need fish to make fish. So for us, it's very important to understand what we have um, as a content of fish in total and to ensure that that base population of fish is capable of reproducing um, both for themselves, for a conservation perspective, but then think of it like a bank account. Anything else off the top can be harvested first and foremost for First Nations and Métis. Uh, and then after that for recreational anglers uh, to benefit from that fishery as well. We want to be able to communicate to folks what is the current state of Lesser Slave Lake, what options could we actually start talking about, get some, you know, kind of some early feedback on that uh, kind of the State of the Union, if you will, Michael, on, on Lesser Slave Lake, and then be able to go out with some informed uh, options, you know, based upon that input and, uh, and have Albertans, you know, be across the province really be able to kind of weigh in uh, and indicate what do they want for the fishery for Lesser Slave Lake uh, going forward. So there are certainly many factors to consider as a new fish management strategy uh, comes together. But I think the one thing that we can all agree on is that uh, a walleye shore lunch sure tastes good. Oh, outstanding. Hey, thanks for watching everyone. From Lesser Slave Lake, I'm Michael Short with a mouthful of walleye. We'll see you next time. Let's go outdoors. Time for more fish.